You're the man with the data. We've got some coin metrics charts, but before we get to those, just want to get your initial views on Gary Gensler. He's a former Commodity Futures Trading Commission chair from the Obama administration, a senior advisor to the MIT Media Lab, where he taught digital assets. What do you make of someone knowledgeable of crypto like Gensler leading the SEC? That's exactly what I make of it. I think it's good for the space, given that he is knowledgeable and he knows it, and he's not someone to be afraid of it. I think his comments today may have been taken a little out of context. You know, when asked about fraud, you know, you're going to acknowledge that there is some fraud in this space. However, um, he did say that there are applications that are beneficial to the overall financial ecosystem. So I think that um, his comments, you know, can be seen both ways in the markets. And I think he is a net benefit and net positive for the space. Yeah, a very reasoned and uh, a very balanced view. All right, turning to BTC markets, we have some charts, like I mentioned, so break it down for us. First up, Bitcoin's correlation with the S&P 500. Some believe Bitcoin will decouple from the stock markets, that BTC is a safe haven asset that is a hedge against the traditional markets. It looked like we were seeing that earlier in February when the markets were down and Bitcoin was shooting up. On the other hand, others believe BTC and the stock market go hand in hand. Give us your analysis. Yeah, so I think what you see here is quite a few different um, regimes. You've got the sell-off in, in March from, with COVID, and I think that you know the beta of everything does go to one on the way down. I think that that was very true during that time. And during the recovery, when everything went up, you, know, you had stocks going up and you had Bitcoin going up. Uh, however, as we approached the election, stocks cooled off a bit as people took some risk off and the Bitcoin hedge for political uncertainty was at an all-time high. So I think that that's why you saw some of the correlation come down there. However, right now, as people are nervous whether or not it's a risk-off time in, in equities, people are seeming to take some off of Bitcoin. So I think that's why you're seeing it come back up. However, you know, longer term, if the two do become highly uncorrelated, uh, I think that's only a good thing for Bitcoin and it makes it more of a... Uh, a hedge to traditional portfolio risk. All right. Next, we have BTC futures open interest levels, which hit record highs in February. Tell us what's going on here. Yeah. So I think it was the last time I was on here. We were just about at that top tick. And what happens is when you get high open interest in the space, it's generally a proxy for high leverage on the uh, the futures exchanges and, and futures contracts. And when we had that recent pullback in price, uh, we got that cascade of liquidations that generally tends to happen. And um, that's what we saw play out there. I think it's good to have uh, uh, some of that leverage flushed out of the system to allow us to you know, continue with lower volatility. Mm -hmm. um, last week's liquidations can be seen in our next chart showing the value of liquidated BTC perpetual future contracts for February 12th to the 25th. Walk us through this one. Right. So what you see here is on the X axis, you have the, the price and on the Y axis, you have the um, total cumulative amount of liquidations. And so you can see that on the way up, you had a lot of um, shorts being squeezed out of the market. And th those are those green bars. And on the way back down, you had the the red bars there, which are the, the longs getting liquidated and the uh, larger amount of red or um, you know longs that were liquidated tells you that there was a lot more leverage um, betting long the market and generally you've seen that in the past few weeks just given that there aren't too many bitcoin bears still around or at least those betting against it given that they would likely have been pushed out of the market already but again this shows us that generally those liquidated it, it skews to the uh to the long side just given the, uh, the bullish sentiment in the market. Yeah, we have been seeing some bullish sentiment. All right, so uh, this one I found particularly interesting. The spent output profit ratio, a proxy for price sold over price paid that can estimate whether holders are selling at a profit or at a loss. Explain. Right, exactly. So we, used to, we like to use this at Coinmetrics as a proxy for if someone is selling in profit or in a loss. And generally, because Bitcoin's been going up, people have been selling at, at a profit. Uh, however, on this recent pullback, we did see some what looked to be panic selling in a sense that people were selling at a loss for the first time in a very long time. And I think that that is indicative of a, a shift in sentiment 
to a degree, but also that people are buying these these high prices and some were forced to sell. Is this retail uh, investors or institutional mix of the two? This likely is retail investors, yeah. given the nature of, of wallets and things like that, whereas institutions likely would use an OTC desk or something that you may not see it as clear in the data. Um, but I think that it is, you know, given the nature of Bitcoin and wallets, it is tough to peg it to retail or to institutions. Huge losses this time last year. I see that huge spike downward. All right. And, and finally, this next chart features Coinbase trading volumes. Coinbase released their financials for public viewing last week as they prepare an IPO. And I see that retail trading volume in light blue and institutional trading volume in the cobalt blue with crypto asset volatility on top. Very interesting. What's going on here? Yeah, so I think there's a lot going on here, obviously, given the, the line with volatility as well. Um, but I do think that this shows that Coinbase has really cushioned their, their um, financials with institutional clients. And whether that be that there's just more institutions interested in the space, um, you know, that could be the case. However, based on when it looks like they got that uptick mid-2019, um, I think that they've clearly been building a book of institutions that are consistently buying, uh, you know, it's it's likely small funds, family offices, things like that. However, recently in the past year, we've gotten a lot more large name buyers in the market. And so that's, you know, it, it looks promising for them.